I'm going to have my friend Qui-Gon help me out since I've been drinking all morning. <laughs> uh, that would be a no. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Ichabod version 7. At least that was my stage name. Um, also known as Sisman. Also known as Nathan Hamill. And... Uh, this is basically the same speech I gave at DEF CON this year uh, with a couple of different things. There have been some changes since DEF CON that many of you may not have known about. And I'm going to try to cover them as well as possible in my current condition. My, uh, my official title, I speak on both music issues and information security issues and Music issues tend to be more fun because I can stand up here and bitch about things and people think it's cool. So, I mean, who doesn't like to bitch about things? Uh, I don't even know why I still have that slide in this presentation, but go ahead and move. All right, the purpose of this presentation. One, it's to enlighten people on the current state of the music business. There is a bunch of problems in the music business right now as it relates to musical artists. And the next thing I wanted to do with this presentation is prove that you don't need a multi-million dollar recording contract to make a good recording with today's modern technology. There are many problems with the current system we have in place, with getting an artist to where they need to be, putting them on the radio, getting their CDs done, there are many problems with this process. For the biggest problem we have is that the music business is not about music. It is not any, it doesn't have anything to do with music. It is all about money. It's about image and product. It's about applying formulas to artistic works of art. It's about telling people, hey, this is cool. You should buy this. These music companies, they don't care about you. They don't care if you're getting ripped off for buying a CD. They don't care. All they want is their cut and their money, and they can tell you to go screw yourself. The first bullet item here is really funny. Because just this morning, we were out to breakfast at the little truck stop over here. And on CNN, was it, was it CNN? Yeah. On CNN, they were just reporting that there is a major lawsuit right now against four major record labels for paying, basically through a middleman, to have their songs played on the radio. So that's what's called payola. And I reported this months ago at the DEF CON presentation. And another thing I reported is, is that near the end of my presentation, as I said in the future, Maybe there will be a, a change where instead of having a billboard charts, we'll have a music download charts. A month after DEF CON, the uh, uh, European Union, uh, specifically the UK, started doing a download, a legitimate download billboard charts, basically. The problem with the current system is they're, also, they're resistant to change. Anything new, they don't want to hear anything about it. They like the system they have. They like to complain about how people are pirating music. Yet if you look at the numbers, they're recording record gains. I mean, how can that happen? I mean, if you're, if you're saying that people are downloading music and you're losing revenue, how can you report record earnings? It doesn't make any sense. That's not what they report to the press, but that's really what's happening right now. Free music is actually a promotion for yourself. If you, it's actually been proven that many artists that give away their music for free sell more CDs because people actually want to buy that product if it's good. I mean, if you have a CD and all you have is one good song and people can tell that ahead of time, yeah, they're not going to buy your CD. But if you have a CD and there's a bunch of good songs on there, you stand a lot better chance. Um, another thing is, is it's not how good you are, it's who you know. I mean, how much crap do we have on the, mu on the radio right now? 
I mean, who really wants to listen to all that fucking bullshit that's on the radio right now? I mean, half the stuff that's on there isn't even worth listening to. Uh, and then the, one of the other things, artists retain little or no rights to their music. If you buy a CD at Best Buy or Sam Goody or something else, most of that profit goes right back to the record company and not to the artists. And that's why you don't see a lot of artists complaining about piracy. Because they don't make any money off selling those CDs anyway. You know, I mean, of course, Metallica. That's the one thing you can think of with the whole Napster issue. But that's like one group complaining about that that made a really big stink about it. And actually, Metallica didn't actually go through with any of those lawsuits. They just threatened. And, and groups like Metallica or Madonna or, you know, really high, high, high uh, pay groups, they actually do make money off selling CDs because they can negotiate higher higher uh, levels of pay for selling their CDs. And of course one of the last items is the Pirate Act. They're trying to push through Congress right now uh, an act that says if you have illegal music on your computer then it's not a misdemeanor now, it's a felony. Which is the most ridiculous load of bullshit I've ever seen. have to excuse me, I've been drinking. To so look at my notes, I usually don't use notes. Just make sure I, <laughs> I'm not missing anything. Ah, well, that doesn't matter anyway. Okay, money for the company. Getting a recording contract is like winning the lottery. Only if you win the lottery, you actually make money. If you get a recording contract, there is no guarantee that you're going to make money. And it's like winning the lottery. There are so many people out there who are so... They're just, they just—they have their mind set on being a rock star, that it actually blinds them to what's actually going on. Ninety percent of major label releases don't even turn a profit. Ninety percent—that means these bands you see on MTV, MTV2, that are doing—if if you actually watch that shit—they don't make any money. None. They're out there struggling, and. They're giving off the perception that they're making money, but they're really not. They're usually in debt to the record company for the things that they've been doing. Companies, and, and this, this is a really bad time of year, by the way, if you're a musician. And if you're a musician and you're trying to, to quote-unquote, make it in the music business, you would not want to sign a recording contract at this time of the year. Because what these record labels will do is they'll sign a bunch of groups near the end of the year when it turns over to the new year, they'll write them off as tax write-offs and drop you off the record labels. And it's actually happened to friends of mine, believe me. And of course, who hasn't dealt with the last bullet item? How many people in here think that you actually pay a, pay a fair price for a CD? Anybody? Anybody buy a CD and say, yep, $18 is a fair price for a CD? I didn't think so. All right, why does a CD cost so much? Manufacturing companies say, hey, it's expensive to make CDs. It's expensive to make this product. Mass-produced replicated CDs are usually less than a dollar to make, yet you're paying $18. I mean, if CDs cost so much money, then fucking AOL would be out of business. I mean, who hasn't dealt with like all these AOL CDs coming to your house? It costs a lot to record a CD. Untrue, very untrue. Many recording advances have been made in the past few years. You can actually record a CD in your house and have the same quality that you would get from a commercially recorded CD. Granted, you know, your ears may not have the same experience that some of the major label producers have, but you have the technology to put in your house that will make the same quality recording. These record companies resist change. They fight tooth and nail to keep things the same. You know, it was like 67 years between the time that, that the, the Wright brothers flew at Kitty Hawk to the time we put a man on the moon. And I guarantee you that if the RIAA was in charge of that shit, we'd still be flying fucking biplanes right now. What happens to other companies that resist this change? If they were in the tech business, they'd be out of business. 
I mean, companies that do not learn how to adapt and overcome change go out of business. And that's exactly what's going to happen to them in the future. I like to compare the music business of today to the buggy industry of yesterday. Around the turn of the century when the automobiles started becoming popular, the buggy manufacturers started lobbying in Congress to create all these stupid laws that said, hey, if you own an automobile and you come up to a, you know, a crossing, like an intersection of streets, you'd have to like get out of your vehicle, run around three times, yell in all directions before you cross through the street. The fact of the matter is, is that an automobile was just too efficient. And everybody decided to start using automobiles, and these stupid laws went by the wayside. All right, this has an effect on radio, too. The industry releases 100 songs per week, yet only four are added to the average radio playlist out of those 100. Two radio station conglomerates own 42% of the listeners, which you can guess who those are. And of these companies, Clear Channel, which sucks, cancels support for local musicians so they could make money. Why don't people buy CDs? I mean, why don't you buy CDs if you don't buy them? Usually, this is a big deal. There's nothing worth buying. Plain and simple. They only like one song on a CD. I mean, would you really want to buy a whole CD just for one song? It's too expensive. That's definitely one. Or I can get it for free. The record industry would like you, everyone to think that it's the last bullet item. That they're going off, they're grabbing all this music for free and just not buying it. A majority of the people that I know don't do that. They may go out and, and download a song and listen to it and say, hey, that's pretty cool, I'm going to buy the CD. Or, man, that sucks. You know, I don't want to listen to that anymore. That's actually the least of all of these bullet items. This is one of my biggest pet peeves. When you get signed to a record label, many times you lose a lot of your creative influence over your own music. They tell you, hey, you know, you're going to have to stop this. Um, you know, that's pretty touchy. You shouldn't say that in your music. And many times these groups don't have the ability to change that because they're under an obligation. They're under a contract. One of, the, one of the times when this happened was when Marilyn Manson started first coming out. Uh, Trent Reznor, of course, was helping in that process. They had a song called My Monkey on the first album, and it was basically reciting some lyrics from, the, the, from Charles Manson, something that he had said. Interscope said, mm, I don't think so. Maybe this Marilyn Manson character, you know, we should just dump him all together. You know, this isn't such a very good idea. If it wasn't for Trent Reznor say, standing up saying, you don't, Marilyn Manson, you lose Nine Inch Nails, they, it never would have happened. So it took somebody actually standing up and saying, hey, you know, this is art. You know, take it for what it is. You know, sometimes people have to stand up for what they believe in. Labels often ask artists to change their lyrics or content that they find would be obscene or or anything that they think wouldn't sell an album or wouldn't help sell an album. Like I said, it's all about money. Here's some food for thought. What if these same formulas, usually formulas include uh, songs not lasting over 3 minutes and 30 seconds long. You know, you have to get to the, the hook within 20 seconds or 30 seconds. You have to hook the audience. What if these same formulas were added to Stairway to Heaven or Hotel California or Bohemian Rhapsody. I mean, how would this? I mean, how would that have affected music history? Some of these groups are very influential groups to the music we listen to today. I mean, and what are we missing out on today by having these formulas added to the music we listen to? Music has become so much of a product and less of an art that it's actually turning into something that people don't even want to deal with. I mean. Think about this. Is there actually any group out today that you can go to and you can actually see people crying in the front row? I mean, now granted, that's usually women, but hey, that's a different story. But still, 
Nobody has that kind of an influence over their audience. That used to happen all the time. You know, music was a different music was a different thing back in the old days than it is today. Here we go. The old days. The old days of music, you needed a contract for distribution of your music. If you made music, you had no way to give it to an audience other than getting a distribution deal from a record label. Recording equipment was very expensive. Recording was expensive. Reproduction costs were very costly. Radio was almost impossible to reach without a record label backing you. You know, these, these were the, the things you had to deal with back in the day. Actually, record labels took more of a chance in the old days than they do today. Okay, so what has changed? Recording equipment capable of 44.1 kilohertz, which is CD quality, is very affordable. You can buy this stuff for less than $1,000. Distribution can be done worldwide with no cost to you. There are many websites out there that will host your music for you and let people download it for free. Reproduction prices are cheap. You can usually get your CDs created, mass-produced. You can get 1,000 CDs for less than $1,000 at many times. There are plenty of college and internet radio stations willing to play good music. Recording can be done free with your own equipment. So now you don't have this, this cost of recording your CD over your head. There are more affordable high-speed internet connections. You no longer need to tour the country and go broke to make it in the music business. There are no geographical limitations on where you can live. You can live pretty much anywhere. Which means you can actually be influenced by music that's worldwide because of the internet. Independent music production is the way of the future. People are going to start realizing this and doing it on their own. What this does is, is it levels the playing field. In the past, it wasn't how good you were, it's who you know and who could get you the farthest in the music business. If you can put out your music for free and have people listen to it, it doesn't matter who you are or who you know. Now it's the quality of your music that gets your point across. Artists retain the rights to their material. If you're not signing away the rights to your material, then it's all yours, and you're free to do with it as you please. There are no formulas or templates to apply. You have more variety of music because these people aren't under any obligation to create their music in any certain way. And there are less competition between groups. I've been involved in the music business for many years. And this last bullet item is very big. Many groups have the misconception that there is only one recording contract out there. And if we're not beating everybody else out, then we're never going to get this one recording contract that's out there. If you desire a recording contract from a major label, then there's more than one. I mean, there's more than one group out there on the radio. There are many, whenever, whenever one group gets signed from a region, and then you have another group that gets signed from the same region, you start creating what's called a scene. And then the same, a perfect example is Seattle. Everybody remembers the grunge bands. That's the same thing that happened. Music started changing, it started evolving. You have one, two, next thing you know, there are three, four, five, six groups that are making it big, basically, from one area. Okay, so if you wanted to do independent music, what exactly do you need for your recording studio? For electronic music, if you do electronic music, you may only need a good sound card and a computer and some software. That's about it. For recording instruments, vocals, bands, things of that nature, maybe you need an I.O. box or some extra facilities for you to be able to record these extra instruments. And some of these systems are bundled together. The computer recommendations, I wouldn't record anything with less than 512 megabytes of RAM. It's pretty much standard. You'd want a dedicated secondary hard drive 
to stream audio off from that's not part of your operating system running on it currently. CD burner, over two gigahertz processor, and of course no antivirus or anything that runs constantly in the background. So no or carefully screened internet connections. You wouldn't definitely want one to like throw that up. Updated drivers, DMA and hard disk, which is an older issue. Faster the hard disk spins, the better. The faster you can put the audio on and take audio off the disk, the better you'll have less latency. And in the old days, like you'd have to change the role to a network server, which gave it more dedicated processing power. Sound card recommendations. The M Audio Audio File 2496 is a very good card. It only costs you $149. Pretty cheap. And then you start getting into some more expensive cards here. I actually use this card for mastering audio, and it's very solid. I've never had a problem with it. Sound card considerations. You want something with low latency. If you're, if you're using a USB keyboard to play virtual instruments like synthesizers, things like that, when you touch the key, you want the sound to come out pretty much instantaneously. You don't want to hit the key and then have the sound come out a second later. That would definitely mess you up. You'd want something that's at least 2496. You want to make sure that there's an ASIO driver available if you're running Windows stuff. Check for system compatibility and pretty much nothing made by Sound Blaster. Studio monitors. I personally like anything that Event Audio makes. Very good company. The TR8Ns are the ones that replace the ones I use. You have a Lesis, and M Audio actually makes monitors now. I have no idea how good these are, but um, usually anything made by M Audio is pretty good. Studio monitor considerations, something that's near field reference. The bigger the speaker is, the better the bass. Usually you listen to music from approximately three feet away. So when you're, when you're recording, you're mastering audio, something of that nature, you're going to want to be about three feet away. Your ears will adjust to your monitors. Even if you had the shittiest monitors on the planet to listen to your music, you'll get an idea of how the music should sound later on. And you're going to want something active, which means that the monitor itself is self-contained. The amplifier that pushes the audio is built into the speaker itself, which that will actually decrease your hum and different exterior signals from having that all built in. For microphones, for vocals, the AKG Solid Tube is a very good microphone if you're a strong vocalist. I personally like it. It's what I use. The Neumann TLM-103 which is about the same price as a very good mic. And you can actually pick up some fairly decent condenser mics for less than, for about 150 bucks. For instruments and drums, pretty much anything made by Shure or AKG. Condenser mic for vocals and acoustic instruments. When recording drums, it's always a good practice to use two condenser mics as overheads. Sometimes when you record a drum kit, you need as many as 12 microphones, maybe more. So you want to keep those considerations when you're building your studio if that's what you want to do. And it's not uncommon, like I said, to use you know, 10, 12, 14 mics. If you're using guitars and bass and things of that nature, you can actually get direct boxes like the uh, Line 6 Pod XT or the Line 6 Bass Pod. It cuts out the need for an amplifier. And I take a lot of shit for this being a music producer because there are some people out there who say, you know, it doesn't sound like a real mic'd guitar and all this. You can make these things sound like anything as long as you have the ear to do it. So I've had very good luck making these things sound really big, just like an amplifier. The Shure SM57 microphone for micing guitar cabinets is pretty much a standard. Condenser mics for micing bass and cabinets and things of that nature just keep these things in mind. Like if you're if you're living in, in a, an apartment, you're probably not going to be able to blast a you know Marshall half stack or something of that nature. So some of these actually come in handy. Miking drums, you can usually get a prepackaged drum kit for $199 and up. Remember, you usually get what you pay for. 
And uh, Pro, Pro Tools Sound Replacer is, uh, can actually make a really shitty recording of drums sound really good. Basically what it is is you can load a sample up of a really good sounding drum and layer it over everything you've already recorded that sounded like crap. I mean, all these things are things that you'd pay a producer $50,000 to do, and you can do them in your own house. And that's all they're going to do. Software recommendations for electronic instruments, things of that nature. I prefer Propellerhead's Reason. Very good product. It's not too expensive. Um, Acid, if you like that kind of stuff, if you like to remix VST instruments, things like that. Cubase X, SX, very good product. Pro Tools is pretty much the standard recording software of the music business. If you're in a band and you get signed and everything else and you fly out to California to record your album, almost 100% of the time you're going to be recording on a Pro Tools system. Now, WaveLab is what I use to edit WAV files and master audio. Okay, I decided to give a breakdown of what certain people do when you go to record music. Engineer is usually the person who gives stuffs ready. Sometimes they record tracks. Mixing engineer is the person who takes everything, your guitar, your bass, your drums, and they put them in the proper places and add EQ, things of that nature. A mastering engineer is somebody who takes the process of mixing the two stereo waves, the left side and the right side. They take those and refine them and make them sound better. And, of course, the producer is the person who makes sure everything sounds good from start to finish. A lot of times a producer will put creative input. Like they'll say, okay, that sounds really good, but you know, what if you change this a little bit? Or what if you move this over here? Or what if you did this here? That's what a producer does. They basically make, things, everything, make sure everything sounds good from start to finish. Now, there are some problems with the independent music system. Advertising and promotion. Not a lot of people have a lot of money to spend on promoting their own music. There are misconceptions that if you're not signed to a major record label, then you must not be any good, which couldn't be further from the truth. There are no rating systems for independent music. There are some uh, places like GarageBand.com and uh, sites like that that will do peer review but you're still not getting a real uh, person who's experienced in the music business to look at your music. And there's no good standard way to collect money for plays of your song. Independent artist tips. These are some tips that I would give to any independent person trying to start making their own music and putting it out to the world. First of all, have a good website. How many people have been to somebody's website and go, oh my god, that sucks. Did they let their three-year-old build that shit? Present yourself well. I mean, uh, present yourself bigger than you are. If you're trying to impress people, you know, you'd want to kind of throw your image out there a little bit. I mean, make it look like a bunch of people worked on your album and just things like that. Communicate and create friendships with other independent artists. That's very important. If, if you're going out there and you're playing music... The best thing to do is have friends. Friends work together to help each other out. They may have equipment that you don't, that you can borrow, and vice versa. Create independent musical networks, which is kind of the same thing. Know where you are and know where you need to improve. That is a big problem. Some people do not know that they suck, and that's a problem. If you know that your music is horrible, then please don't share it with the world or let them know, hey, I'm working on being better. Because what happens is, is you, you end up having people who put their music out there and saying, hey, man, we're doing this, and people listen, and it reinforces that misconception that, hey, you know, if you're not signed to a major record label, then you must not be any good. So know where you need to improve. Now, I'm not saying if you suck, you shouldn't do your own music. I mean, that's a ridiculous thing to say. I'm just saying, know where you are and know where you need to improve. Now, if you're an independent music producer, such as me, don't get frustrated. Especially if you don't have a lot of experience producing music. There's a lot of trial and error that goes on. 
I mean, mess around. If you're not on the clock, and you're, I mean, the only time you're wasting is your own. If you allow time to, to get better at what you do, it'll go a long way. Remember, it's easier to add than take away. If you're recording a guitar, and you're pushing it right out there, and you're like, hmm, maybe that's a little too hot, maybe not. You know, maybe I'm adding a little bit too much to this. It's always better to back off and then to add later. Listen to your mixes on many different systems. If you've mixed audio down, listen to it in your car, in your, stere your home stereo, on a boom box. I mean, believe it or not, music sounds pretty horrible on a boom box. So if you can make it sound good there, you're probably pretty good to go. Get accustomed to your studio monitors. And listen to music in a realistic environment. Not a lot of people listen to music in a carpeted, padded room. So if you're, if you're sitting there in, in a carpeted, padded room listening to your music, that's probably not a really good representation of what your music's going to sound like when you put it out there. Your ears can deceive you. And don't be afraid to like ask people what they think. To a point. If you show somebody your music and they say, wow, that sounds really good. Sometimes it's good to probe them for an extra response. Like, hey, is there anything else you would do? And sometimes that's bad. If you say, hey, is there anything else you should do? Sometimes people feel obligated to tell you something. So that can actually be bad because you're, you're getting a response that normally you wouldn't get. You can usually tell if somebody likes something or doesn't like something by looking at their face. Layer your instruments. If you're recording guitars, don't just record one guitar, record four. Pan them left and right, you know, all the way left and all the way right. What that does is it creates a stereo image. Basically, these are the things that you're paying a producer thousands of dollars to do for you that you can do yourself. Create stereo effects, like I said, by creating two tracks of the same audio and panning them all the way right and all the way left. You will never play the same part exactly the same twice. It'll sound the same, but you're always a little bit different. That, th those, little incon uh, those little inconsistencies will actually create a, a wide stereo effect. Don't be afraid to experiment and try new things. Be mindful of effects that make your music sound dated, unless that is your goal. If you want to sound like Warrant, Kiss, or Slaughter, then be my guest. I mean, but if you don't, if you're trying to sound modern, there's nothing wrong with having hints of older music in your music. That's fine. But be, I mean, just be mindful that if you layer a ton of reverb on your music, you're going to sound like the fucking Beatles or some shit. Clean, punchy, and equalize right to the edge is a modern, has a modern feel. Uh, the, the prior Chevelle album, um, what, uh, Wonder What's Next. If you listen to that CD, it is distorting digitally. And there are many music producers who listen to that and go, oh, that sounds horrible. But the normal, normal listener doesn't hear that. They don't know the difference. All they know is it's fucking loud and they like it. Learn what each EQ range sounds like and know what your, so what your music is missing. If you don't know what 800 or 1,000 or 200 sounds like, then basically what you do is you take that slider on your EQ and you move it all the way up and all the way down, all the way up and all the way down and keep listening to it and you'll hear the difference that it makes. When you compare your music to other people who have spent thousands of dollars to have their stuff done, you'll realize what they were doing too. Okay, I've made my own music, so now what the hell do I do with it? Post it online. Give it away to people. Let them know who you are. They're never going to know who you are if you don't give them a sample or something to show them who you are. Share it through P2P. You know, this is a big deal lately with modern music. The RIAA went to Congress and said, we need to ban P2P because it entices children to have sex. I am not shitting. A fucking lollipop entices a child to have sex more than fucking P2P does. You know? 
you don't like say, hey, little girl, you look mighty fine. Want to see Kaza? Or, hey, you're looking mighty fine in those oshbosh goshes. You know, want to see my lime wire? I mean, that's about how ridiculous it is. But you have these old fucks in Congress, like Orrin Hatch, who can't even fucking tell his ass from a hole in the ground, making decisions for you. That's ridiculous. This fucker doesn't know the difference. He doesn't even touch his own computer. He has some staff bitch do that shit for him. And yet he is making decisions on your freedoms. You know? For one thing, he's from fucking Utah, which you should just write that shit off. You know? Utah does suck. Fuck Utah! Get people to notice your music. Talk to people. You know, be personable with them, you know? I mean, you spend hours downloading porn on the internet. Cut some of your porn time down. 30 minutes a day is all it takes. A fucking Bowflex body takes 20 minutes a week, three times a week. Just think of what you could do if you cut a little bit of porn back, a little bit of Bowflex, you know you ain't going to get on the motherfucker anyway, and just do it. Get CDs made. This is very easy. Look in the back of any music magazine. There's many places that will reproduce your CDs for you. Sell CDs online. CDbaby.com. Spend $35 to set up an account. Send them your CDs. They'll handle all the credit card transactions for you and send you a check. I mean, granted, they take a cut. I mean, everybody takes a cut. But you're making more money selling your CDs than an artist would that's signed to a major label. Share your knowledge with the community. Lessons learned. The more you help out other people, the more they're willing to help out you. Nobody knows everything. Not even Joe Klein. Where's he at? Uh, I, hear him bulls I hear him bullshitting back there. That's okay. Find internet and college radio stations willing to play your stuff. Just about every major city has a university or a college with a radio station. Go talk to these people. I mean, they're just fucking students playing music. Talk to them, say, hey, I have some music. You want to take a listen to it? If you like it, play it. I don't give a fuck. Find places that can charge for plays of your music like Apple iTunes. Yes, you can get your music on iTunes if you wish. CD Baby has a distribution with them that you can actually sell your music on iTunes if that's what you want to do. But trust me, it's better to give your music away and let people buy your CDs. You'll, you'll notice a lot. Like currently, I'm so lazy, our last, or CD before last is sold out on cdbaby.com. There's like five people waiting for back orders. And yes, I'm too lazy to send CDs in, which I will eventually. Don't do that. I'm not currently doing, <laughs> I'm not currently working in that field. So yes, I'm procrastinating. Use songs to promote yourself and your website. When you're in a band, usually, unless you're a huge artist, you don't sell stickers and things of that nature because they're promotional tools. Give stickers and things away so that people will put them on things and people will say, hey, what's that? You know, things with your website on it. Use your music to do the same thing, to draw attention to you as the artist. Community helping each other. Collaborative recording processes. Files can be sent over the net. Mixes and mastered elsewhere. The last album I did with my last group, the guy sat in Orlando, Florida, and was mixing and streaming it over the internet, and I was listening to it in Jacksonville, Florida, producing it. And granted, there was some latency there. I couldn't go, stop right there, that didn't sound good. I had to say, stop right there 10 seconds ago, that didn't sound good. So, there are plenty of help through music forums, and yes, I do hang out in some of these as far as recording forums and things of that nature. I do sit there and give advice, people having problems or trying to use, maybe, a, maybe use a program that they haven't used before. Streaming audio, share your talents. If you have a talent, like say, for instance, me, I hate mastering audio. It's like the bane of my existence. I never think it sounds good. People can tell me 20 ways from Sunday that something sounds good, and I'll always hear something wrong with it. It's not something I like doing at all. 
If, you, if you're really good at mixing audio and that's what you like to do, then switch out with a different group. Like maybe somebody who's good at mastering audio, but maybe doesn't want to mix their own stuff. Share your talents. There's a worldwide collection of talent. Digidesign.com has, which is the company that makes Pro Tools, they have forums where people actually trade talents like that. What does the future hold? Like I said, instead of the billboard charts, we have the download charts. Places in Europe are already starting to do this. Maybe we have some different royalty collection methods. More quality independent artists. As the music equipment becomes more affordable and higher quality, you'll have better independent artists. Of course, it's always in your ear. So if you can't hear when something sounds good, it doesn't matter how good your equipment is, it's still going to suck. So that's why you need it maybe switch out with some other people. Artists retain the rights to their music, more variety, system structure changes, and progress that actually moves forward. What needs to happen? A service that's reasonably priced that pays artists. I honestly think that if you could get all the music you'd want to download for maybe approximately $5 a month, I think people might actually go for that. Attention needs to be drawn to the advantages of an independent system. Believe it or not, many people are getting to the point where they are not buying CDs because they're tired of all the crap that's out there. And with everybody threatening to sue people and all this, they'd rather just stay away from it. Investors need to be drawn for a new system and a willingness to take a chance on independent artists. All right, now we're going to get to the project that I did. I did basically, I wanted to prove that you don't need to spend thousands of dollars on a recording and go to this big, huge recording studio to make a good recording. Now I'm repeating myself. Sorry. Basically, I wanted to redo In Your Eyes by Peter Gabriel with some heavy ass guitar. Uh, my friend Gene was nice enough to point out after I already started the project, he's like, hey man. You know, another group just did that as playing, of course, because Jacksonville sucks and the f all the radio stations are owned by Clear Channel. Of course, they're not playing anything new because they're not getting paid off. So he called me up and told me this, and that pissed me off. I'm like, I'm going to look like a fucking copycat now. But then I got to thinking about that. I'm like, they just recently redid it, and I did it in my apartment, in my apartment without disturbing my neighbors with less than superior recording equipment. I was like, if I can prove I can do this, then that would be one hell of a project. So I put the details of my project, which I've been so busy lately I haven't been able to fill out the last part of it, on loopbackimposter.com, project.html. Basically, I walked through everything I did. Some, and I even went into some of my thought processes of why I did it. And my version is available on the music HTML portion, you can download it from there and take a listen to it. And then you can compare my version in SR-71s. On my site, I have papers, which I don't really have a lot of right now. Some music, I have reviews. I do uh, reviews of people's independent music. So if you send me something and you say, hey, I'd like you to check out my group, let me know what you think. I do a lot of that. I have resources and my contact info. And I have some useful links for everybody. If you're into the music business and you want to expand your horizons a bit, some of these are very good sites. I'm about to quit supporting AmpCast.com, though, man. They're charging people way too much money to host their music. But a lot of these are very good sites, especially HomeRecording.com. It's an audio forum that you can go to and post questions, and people will be more than happy to answer you. I mean... A lot of us work in the tech business. I mean, nobody likes to do anything better than brag about what they know. I mean, you can get somebody to cough up so much information by just starting a conversation with them. The same thing with the music business. Everybody wants to, like, brag about what they know. If you post a question on this forum, homerecording.com, within three hours, approximately, you're going to get an answer. People look at that. I mean, there's tons of people on that forum. cdbaby.com, and, of course... Last one, one of my favorites, EFF.org. And that's pretty much it. Anybody have any questions? 
Oh, come on. Somebody's got to have a question. All right, go ahead. Have I ever heard of Magnatune? No, I have not. How many percent? 50 percent? That's very good. That's a very interesting method. Magnatune.com. Anyway, I will I will look that up. Yes. Um, interesting question. I had, when I did this talk at DEF CON, I had no idea there was somebody from the company that actually created, and I, I didn't get into a lot of that, and I'm sorry. Um, uh, I had a, I had a point where I, I took it off, because a lot of people don't know when they, when they buy CDs, some of these CDs have anti-copy protection built onto the CD. And I just bought the new Chevelle CD, and although I don't think it, because I don't run it in Windows, I don't know if it was trying to auto-load anything or not, but there's a huge FBI logo on the front of it. It's, I mean, it's like huge. It like takes up the whole front saying anti-copy, you know, you can't copy this because it's against the law. Every, most people know it's illegal to copy these things anyway. That big, huge FBI logo doesn't do anything, you know, but some... Um, the Velvet Revolver CD, for sure, and uh, the Beastie Boys' new album will actually auto-run this software on your system so you can't, like, rip it to MP3 and you can't copy it. And basically, that means that you, once you bought the CD, you can't put it on your, your iPad, or not your iPad, your iPod. You can't make the, sorry, you can't, you can't put it on these systems, but you paid for it. And, and on top of that, what if you bought the tape years ago? I mean, you still paid for that music. You paid for the ability to listen to that music. You're not paying for the ability to listen to it on that medium. You know, what if you bought the record back in the 60s? You know, my parents are fucking old, man. You know, what if they wanted to download some MP3s, which they wouldn't know how to do anyway. But still, I mean, where, where do we cross the line on that? I, don't, I personally don't know. My opinion is, is if you purchased the right to listen to that song then you've purchased the right to listen to that song no matter what medium it's on. But I think, I think it's bullshit that there isn't enough uh, uh, warning, basically, of putting this into your music. An another thing that I forgot to talk about was the fact that th the recording industry uses everybody as guinea pigs. They will take like new CDs that have new copy protection software on them knowing that it won't work on certain systems, and they'll put out a test group like, say, in Jacksonville, they'll put out these CDs that they know have been not working on certain systems and test you out with them. And the return rate on these things is like 7%. That is a large amount of returns. And they have it so ingrained in everybody's mind that once you buy a piece of software or once you buy a CD, if you break the seal on it, you can't return it. That's actually bullshit. If you go back to Best Buy and say, hey, I bought the CD and it doesn't play in my CD player, they're supposed to give you your money back. I mean, but th like I said, there's this humongous, they've ingrained it in our heads that if you buy a CD, it's yours. You break the seal on it, it's yours. You know, you can't return it, which is actually untrue. Any other questions? Less than 15, okay. The question was, uh, ballpark figure on a decent home recording studio. When I say decent, I, I'm, I'm going off 
You can buy a Pro Tools LE system, which is the lightweight edition of the very same thing that all these major label people are using. You can get it, especially if you go on eBay, you can get uh, a 001 system for about $600 used, and as long as the software is legit and everything else. And um, basically all you need after that is a microphone and some studio monitors, so usually less than $1,500. And it's better than a lot of things you got three years ago. If, if you want to do a badass studio, you're probably talking about six, six Gs. If you wanted to actually like create your own recording studio, you could probably do that f um, for about six grand. The only thing I would I would like to to say is some of these Roland um, Roland has a VS sixteen eighty and a VS twenty four forty or whatever. I have never heard any of those that sound worth a shit. So just kind of stay away from that. The, the best thing to do when you're recording music, like I said this is totally an opinion now, so is to have something that records onto a computer because once you get the wave up, you can see it on the screen and edit it. It's a lot easier to edit a wave. You can go right here and like, like me, if I'm recording something and I see a pop in the music, I can actually visually see that pop and I can correct it without ever having to re-record that track. Pro Tools is actually supposed to be a single take system. You cut and paste things and you don't ever have to record the track again, which it can be that way, but you take some of the realism out of the music, in my opinion, so sometimes I'll make myself redo something. Yes? Actually, I think you can get the, uh, a, a lightweight version of the software for free. The, the biggest part about Pro Tools is the hardware. And basically it's an I.O. box that you plug instruments and things into, and that's what they push. What operating system were you running it on? You weren't running it on like Windows Millennium or anything, were you? Running it on 98? It, yes, and it, w running it on Windows 98 is not the most brilliant thing to do. But the, it, it worked for the, the most part. If you run the newer version on Windows XP, of course, it runs on either Windows XP or Mac. I mean, th there's no other things to use it on. If you run it on XP, it's actually fairly stable. And, uh, of course, everybody knows that, that Mac used to hold the market on that. I mean, as much as I hate to admit it, some of the things have actually become very stable because uh, a lot of these manufacturers see that, you know, uh, Windows PCs have dominated the market. So they've been focusing a lot on that. Yes. It depends on what you consider good. I think that, oh, you like Fred Durst from Jacksonville, Florida? There is a plug-in for Pro Tools called Antares Auto-Tune, and if you're singing out of key, it'll actually pitch correct your voice. I personally, being a singer, I think it's stupid as hell, but um, obviously Fred Durst found a good use for it, and it made him a lot of money, and I mean, now he's just left on his shitty lyrics, so. Any other questions? Yes. Sound Blaster has uh, typically had some really shitty drivers made for it. And uh, some of their cards, like, it, and this has been a while ago, that when they came out with the Audigy at first, it was supposedly a 2496 card, which it really wasn't. It was emulating 2496. So some people were trying to record 24-bit audio with it, and it was like totally cropping out their systems. And uh, the latency for it, like if you're running VST instruments, like if you have a keyboard and you're pressing the keys, you'd usually get about a second's worth of delay or more, sometimes more. So you'd hit it, and you'd be like trying to play along with a song, and it'd be like, ding, ding, and of course you can't do that. So that's usually why. But I've never seen anybody say, hey, I have a Sound Blaster card, and it rocks. It's usually, what the hell am I doing wrong? I sound like shit. Yes.
usually the the uh, the question was uh, the the audio cards having balanced inputs. When I record audio, from my experience, most of the cards I've used to actually record the audio into it had an external breakout box. So even though it was a PC, PCI card, they had it like DigiDesign Pro Tools makes custom adapters that go to a breakout box, and they have balanced inputs. That's correct. The uh, audio file card does not. It has RCA inputs and outputs, and I use that mainly for VST instruments, which they're, if you're running VST instruments, they're already on the box so you're not having input problems. It goes over USB or MIDI and, uh, and output. And a lot of that helps with having studio monitors that have the power amps built into them so you don't pick up the external noise. I don't totally agree with that. Uh, I do believe that you should have more than one set of, of speakers that you listen to things on. I don't believe that it has to be monitored that way. If you, if you create a mix and then you listen to it in your car or your stereo system, you'll usually get an idea of that, maybe something you didn't hear. Like mixing on headphones is really stupid because you'll never get a good mix. But then again, listening on headphones, you may hear something that you didn't hear before that was in the mix. So. To a point, yes, I agree with you, and then to a point, I don't think that you need to have those monitors hooked up to your recording system. Well, now, now you have 5.1 surround sound, too. That's correct, and that's why it's good when you make a mix or a master, you take it and listen to it in a bunch of different systems. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much.